Welcome, everybody, to uh, our latest webinar. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, we put we we offer these webinars um, on a monthly basis with some of our trusted business partners. And today, I have Adam Whitaker, who is a vice president of SBA Small Business um, Finance. He's a he's a SBA expert with the First National Bank FNB as some of you might know them. They have branch offices in the Mid-Atlantic region and they do SBA lending in the Eastern, anywhere in the East, East, east of the Mississippi, right, Adam, as he says. Right. And uh, Adam is, is here to talk to us all about the ins and outs of the various SBA loans that are available out there for small business owners. And I really think that this is a topic that is just so important for s small business people to better understand, right? Access to capital, is a key element of success for any small business. And that's certainly been uh, particularly true during this last year or so uh, du during COVID. You know, access to capital is very key. And having a banking relationship also is very important for small business people too. And for some small businesses that didn't have a much of a, a business relationship, if they were just doing, had a bank account and they were doing deposits and didn't really have a lending relationship with a, a lender, they found out maybe the hard way how difficult it can be to get in line for a PPP loan, uh, because that really was a bit of a relationship reliant type of a process because of the, 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 the limited nature of the funds that were available, at least in that first round. So having a great banking relationship is important um, as well. So with that, um, again, I'll introduce Adam Whitaker here from FNB, and I'm going to hand it over to Adam. Fire away. Thank you, Michael. I appreciate it. And thank you all for joining us today. Um, I have a slide here, a slide deck here that I'll uh, share my screen here within in a moment. But, um, you know, the, the thing that I would like to say is that if there are any questions at any point, please feel free to um, interject or, or stop me. Um, the more dialogue, the better. Uh, I tried to be the SBA government lending in general can be um, a little bit voluminous in the, the nuances. And I tried to keep this succinct and to the point with some of the, the salient details, but there are certainly individual cases that um, a particular question might, you know, we could spend a little bit more time detailing. But um, so with that, give me one second. You should be able to share your screen. I enabled that. And if you all will post your questions or comments in the chat, uh, I'll be monitoring that from time to time, and maybe I'll pitch some to Adam as they as they come in. But uh, feel also free to, to chime in wherever uh, wherever you have a, a, a question. All right. So is everyone able to see my slide, uh, my screen now? Okay, perfect. Yes, so sir. The, um, so SBA loans. Before they used to have a connotation um, of instead of the, the Small Business Administration that uh, they were the uh, loans that shouldn't be approved. That's what the acronym some people used to joke about SBA stood for. But um, having been made my career out of SBA lending and previously worked for the agency, I do believe truly that these are some of the best kept secrets in financing, um, and largely due to um, misconceptions from years ago, decades ago, really, people still have negative connotations at some point uh, or on some level. So hopefully we can um, get past that and, you know, uncover the real value that these loans have for individuals. So here's what we'll talk about today. Um, you know, basically just to be able to arm everybody with enough knowledge to be dangerous, really, and understand where the value and lies with these types of loans. So high-level overview about First National Bank. Um, as Michael mentioned, we're a, uh, a bank located, headquartered here in Pittsburgh. We have offices throughout the Mid-Atlantic region. We're about $38 billion in assets. So, you know, um, mid-sized bank, basically. Um, and then this is the territory to which we, we cover from an SBA lending perspective. Now, that's important because some lenders are geographically bound to their geographic footprint, others are nation, national and others have some type of hybrid footprint. So the, you know, the 
as we'll talk about here in, in some future slides, the biggest limitation to an SBA loan is that it's located within the United States um, and the, the territories to then which the lender itself has the ability to lend. So uh, benefits of an SBA, SBA loan. Basically, an SBA loan is a creative financing solution for borrowers who otherwise can't achieve financing under the means in which they wish to achieve it. Now, that's not to say that they can't achieve financing, period. It's just that they're looking for something different than what conventional credit standards would require. So the, the products, which we'll talk about, there's two in particular, generally are going to allow for a lower down payment than what would conventionally be allowed, which allows for greater cash flow retention from the business, as, long, as well as longer terms than what would typically be achievable from a conventional financing perspective. And we'll talk about that as well. Um, another big benefit of an SBA loan, of an SBA loan is, is that these are fully amortizing loans. So there are no balloons. Uh, there's no risk of refinancing unless the borrower is, you know, chooses to refinance. Additionally, there should be no loan covenant on these loans. And we can talk about that further, but that's a big, Big thing. There are no outside of payment. There is no. There are no other covenants to these loans. Additionally, most of the time, these loans are not fully secured. That's one of the primary tenets of the SBA um, program um, is to overcome that shortfall. And then, additionally, the multiple uses of proceeds that you typically find within one loan under the uh, the particular program. We'll talk about the Seven A program, which that is a departure from conventional lending where conventionally banks tend to create loans based specifically off the use of proceeds and the life at which they would like to see that debt amortize. So real quick, before we jump into specifics, I wanted to bring to everyone's attention um, some of the benefits or enhancements that exist through the Economic Aid Act that was signed on December 27th of this past year. So previously, Last year, under the CARES Act, borrowers for 7A and 5 SBA loans, I should say, were able to receive six months of payments to be made on their behalf by the government. Now, that enhancement had a sunset of September 30th of 2020. And so in December of 27th of, of this past year, when legislation was reapproved, kind of extending the CARES Act, some additional features were added at, and or that payment relief was extended. So as you can see, uh, one of the first big things is this, uh, is the first bullet about the guarantee fee and the CDC processing fee being waived for borrowers. So in general, on an SBA loan, whether we're talking about a 504 or 7A loan, the fee that is associated is essentially the funding fee that pays for the program. Um, while it's a budget line item on the uh, on a government's budget, the program is entirely self-funded and the way it's self-funded is through these fees. Now, that being said, these fees are typically material while they're not an out-of-pocket expense at closing for the customer there's still material charges. Um, for example, the 7A loan is usually a fee of roughly 3% of the loan amount. So the waiver of that is a, is a nice enhancement at this point in time. Now it says the sunset is September 30th of 2021. That is also contingent upon money that has been allocated for that lasting in, until that point in time. There is some conversations um, within the industry that the allocation of funds could run out as early as July for these for that uh, fee waiver allocation. Um, so Adam, and then Adam, additionally, Adam, can I ask ahead, you Michael. just a quick question? So, mm -hmm. just for example, on a five hundred thousand dollar loan, the funding fee would be about fifteen thousand dollars at at three percent. Sound about yeah. right? Yep. So that's a pretty significant yep, savings it. there. And when you say the deadline is September 30th, assuming that they don't they don't run out of the allocation, that's for loans that fund by that date. Is that right? I mean, you close. So for, is that a close by deadline? 
So the the debt the the trigger is the application to the government, ah, and okay. um, this ties into something in another slide. But basically, it's the point in time in which the allocation for the loan funds is made on the government's system. That doesn't necessarily mean that the loan has closed or funded. That's good. The, Thank you. Um, absolutely. Yeah. Um, and I mean, that, and, and truthfully, that is a big, that is a, uh, an important detail because a lot of times, as we'll talk about in future slides, the closing process for a loan can be fairly substantial in time, but the length of time that it takes to, to get the allocation is not a, as long. Um, and we can talk about that in more detail, but that is that is nice that we have the ability under at least the current legislation to do that. So, and then the word, the debt the word to the that, wise is get your applications in. <laughs> exactly. Sooner exactly. rather than later, and get so, your allocation. <laughs> right. Right. And so, and to, and to that point, it's uh, the application to the bank is the first step, but then once the bank approves it, it's then basically potentially approved by the government. Um, and that's what we'll talk about here in a, in a future slide, but, but yes, absolutely. Word to the wise. If anybody's on the fence about doing something, the sooner you can do something, the better. Um, and then the debt relief payments. Um, again, as I mentioned before, previously, all borrowers last year received six months of payments from the government. Now, this was existing and new borrowers. Under the legislation in December, existing and new borrowers again got an additional three months of payments now this time they capped it up to nine thousand dollars where previously it was uncapped so borrowers um existing and future uh up until september 30th or the the funds running out will receive three months of payments being made on their behalf by the government so that's a critical that's a, a that's a key point to make too because while it's not a a materially large amortization of debt, it's still some principal reduction that is occurring on their behalf. Now, previously, people were concerned that that would be treated as income from a tax perspective, but with the Economic Aid Act legislation, they also mentioned or clarified that these payments are not to be treated as income from a tax perspective. So um, basically free money that's being provided to borrowers. So from so to get into the, the nuts and bolts, if you will, of SBA lending, there are two specific programs to which exist underneath the SBA um, that are primarily bank sponsored. And then I threw this third one in here about the government sponsored one, which is um, the disaster loans, just because of some of their relative recent uh, celebrity, if you will. But the majority of our conversation will be based upon the 7A and the 504 programs. So bank-sponsored 7A, 504 programs, what's the big difference between the two? So the 7A program is a loan program that acts very similar to how, say, a, um, a HUD loan or something similar to that nature would work from a residential lending perspective. The program is such that the bank is the one lending the money and then a they are receiving a guarantee on that from the government up to a certain percentage and what that means is is the bank loses a hundred dollars let's say uh up, you know upon default they will receive up to 75 percent typically in reimbursement from the government so this program can go up to five million dollars which is was previously a million dollars back at the uh, back in 2011. So they've increased it, you know, in the last decade, I guess would be the point to say there. Um, it's typically the most common program for the specific purpose of the fact that it allows for multiple uses uh, within the program. Um, typically, it, these loans are under secured, um, either because of the fact that we're financing some type of intangible or some sort of working capital or even goodwill. Um, those, that's a large reason as to why these things are typically unsecured, undersecured, or just the fact that they tend to have higher advance rates. 
Um, generally, these loans are going to be longer amortizing than conventional. And we'll talk about the specific amortizations that are available. And then also, this allows for potentially up to 100% fin uh, financing. Um, that's a more unique of a circumstance. Generally speaking, you'll see 90% uh, as the benchmark. Um, but there are certain circumstances where it can be 100% financing. Um, and then generally speaking, you're talking about 7A loans being one loan made instead of multiple loans. Um, the 504 program, on the other hand, is a bank-sponsored program where in which the bank partners with the government um, or specifically an agent of the government to create to fund a project. Now, as you see, this allows for a much larger funding threshold. It will go up to $14.5 million. Um, and generally, the reason for this is the reason that this can go so large is because this is a, primarily and only a fixed asset financing program. So what that means is that you're generally financing either real estate or some type of heavy fixed piece of equipment. Um, rolling stock, for example, is not allowed. Inventory is not allowed, things of that nature. Um, it can go up to 90% LTV. That would be the highest it can go. Um, and as I mentioned, being that the bank partners with the government, two loans are ultimately made, one from the bank and one from the SBA. Um, the benefit to the 504 program is that the fixed, the interest rate charge on this is going to be significantly better. Um, even from a conventional financing perspective, the portion of this program that is funded by the government is bond funded. And what you'll see is um, either a 10, 20, or 25 year term loan that has interest, the interest rate fixed for the life of it. And right now, the 25 year bond, if you will, is around 3.2%. So 25 years fixed for 3.2% is pretty good, is very good. Um, and then just real quick, the government sponsored program disaster loans. Really, these are loans that are to be made when banks would not otherwise lend for a variety of reasons. Typically, there is some type of, it will always, there will be some type of federally declared disaster. But a lot of times you're looking at businesses where the source of revenue has either stopped temporarily or for the foreseeable future. And this is designed to be some type of funding method for which the business can get back on its feet. Um, and it's reflected as such with the, the way it's structured and that these are going to be 30 year loan terms on very low interest rates. Adam, Any this like, an example that? of that would have been like the EIDL loans that were um, a lot in the news uh, in last year exactly. during COVID. Yeah. Yep. That's one of the sort of subsets of the disaster loans, the EIDL loan. Yep. Okay. And in fact, they, Oddly enough, the disaster loans can actually be provided to um, consumers when their homes are um, destroyed in a federally declared disaster as well. So, um, but, um, uh, Wes, yes. Wes asks a question, is, is there a size limit of the small business asking for the loan? Do they, is there, do they size out in essence or, and maybe on the other well, end as well? So from a, from a, from a minimum requirement, no, it's typically institution dependent um, as to what their minimum thresholds are to which they offer the product. The reason being is the administrative and technical expertise that's required sometimes doesn't necessarily always align from the, the profitability on those, or there's just not a process set up for those small ones. Um, on the large side, from a, from a loan perspective, and that's what I was in that's what I understood the question to be, loan size. Um, can any, can any business apply? Like, could Microsoft apply for a uh, SBA 7A loan? But technically, no. That, well, yeah, no. Not in the, Publicly traded companies definitely would not be a, able to um, apply for a loan. Um, the next slide, I think, actually will get into this. But basically, they have to be considered to be small underneath the um, SBA size standards, which line up with other size standards, um, 
ship, typically it's based off of the NAICS code, or there's an alternative size standard, which we'll talk about. And you'll see that the alternative can really pick up a lot of companies. So this program can apply to middle market companies, but for profit would be too large. Um, so to piggyback that question into this slide, um, some of the general eligibility requirements. So the borrowers have to be for profit entities for these programs. People under the understanding of the PPP program, borrowers could uh, could qualify under nonprofit type statuses or other types of statuses, but traditionally only for-profit entities are allowed to participate in this program. So that's the first big thing to understand. Um, additionally, and I don't have a slide here, or I don't have a bullet about this, but the business needs to be engaged in commerce. So passive companies, with the exception of real estate holding companies are not allowed to be borrowers in this program as well. Um, so the second bullet, businesses engaged in enterprise that would otherwise not be considered a poor use of taxpayer dollars. So there's a whole list of specific types of enterprise that is not allowed. Um, these are a couple examples. Um, essentially, the, the point here is, is that if you think that it would be um, uncouth or something that the government would not appreciate being associated with um, having supported the funding of, that's probably not going to be eligible from a funding perspective for the program. As I mentioned previously, they need to be located within the United States. Um, and then to the question that was previously asked, considered small under the SBA size standards. So, the alternative size standard, as I mentioned, um, this is where businesses who would break those typical uh, NAICS stand, size standards can qualify, and this picks up a lot of businesses. You'll see that it's not greater than $15 million in, in tangible net worth and no greater than $5 million net income average for the last two years. So that's a pretty substantial amount of companies that would qualify for that. Um, hey, before then, you move on with that, Jimmy says United States means just the states, not Puerto Rico, not um, – does that include protectorates, U.S. protectorates like Puerto Rico? That is a great question. I believe it does qualify for them, uh, that they do qualify there. Um, I can follow up with that. I've never been presented with that question before, so I'm not – 100 percent positive there okay it's I, I i would think it's territories do qualify though um so credit not available otherwise so this is a sort of a, a broad statement um and it's the remnants of an old policy that's not necessarily important to get into but basically what it means is, is to an earlier comment that I made in that the borrower is looking for financing under a particular set of terms that a bank's not otherwise eligible to achieve for them. So, for example, a higher LTV based upon the asset being financed or some level of unsecured lending that's going on, projection-based lending, uh, startup, what have you. There are a, a variety of ways in which this credit not available otherwise can be met. But um, I guess on the flip side, you know, if you have a, a very well-heeled individual looking to borrow at traditional standards, typically we're going to say SBA is probably not the right product for you for a variety of reasons. The, the you know, the administrative burden, the, the cost is more so. Um, Typically, you know, and, and then this is the government's way of saying, too, that they're not looking to mitigate all of the bank's lending risk if you have a borrower willing to do that. Um, and then last bullet point, owner-occupied. Um, for real estate transactions, I should say, they must be owner-occupied. Uh, and that goes back to the, the passive comment earlier. So and uh, institutions themselves from a conventional perspective, we'll look at owner-occupied or define owner-occupied differently sometimes. But um, from the SBA's perspective, owner-occupied means that the business to which is the borrower or is the operating company occupies at least 51% of the rentable square footage of a building. 
Now, there are times where sometimes, let's say you've got a trucking company that has a large par- parking lot for a vehicle fleet, um, and they don't necessarily occupy a large percentage of the indoor rentable square footage, and it gets leased out to a third party, you can oftentimes qualify for the owner-occupied criteria based upon looking at the usage of that parking lot for them specifically. So um, there are wa- there are ways to be creative um, in certain circumstances. I- I had two quick questions on that slide before you you move on, yeah. if that's okay. So, mm-hmm. yeah, owner occupied these programs. The sort of the classic is somebody buying a business, right? That has a place of business, um, and that's that's what you're looking for funding to buy the real estate, um, as well as the business itself. That that would that be sort of the classic example of the use of an seven uh, A loan. Um, that or the uh, business is an existing business that's been renting its space for a period of time and now they're looking to buy it, either right. the space that they've traditionally occupied or you know some larger space. Okay. Correct. I uh, mean, at least from the perspective of real estate. How do you look at borrowers that have common ownership with other business entities uh, do you look at the enterprise for purposes of the SBA size requirements, or do you look at each individual business entity as a standalone? That's a great question. Um, so the first test that they that has to be um, done is is from our principal or principal's perspective, do they have a controlling interest in that affiliate company? Um, so let's just say for the sake, for the hypothetical that we have two principles in our borrower and one of those principles has interest outside of the borrower. If they, um, they don't have greater than 21 or excuse me, greater than 20% ownership in the company, then they're not generally considered to be an affiliate of that principle. Um, additionally, if, They are a minority owner who does not have the ability to influence day-to-day decision-making, then they're not, they're generally not considered to be an affiliate. Um, Now, if the two principals of our borrower own those same affiliates outside of the borrower and together they aggregate to get over one of those two metrics that I mentioned, then that company does get analyzed. And so from the size perspective standards, the the test would be um, based upon how much percentage ownership do they have in that company added into their the the borrower that we're looking at for the SBA loan to determine whether or not we break above above those size standards. So it's a pro rata on those affiliates is the answer. Okay. Yeah, uh, that might be a a point that some borrowers might miss, depending on how their businesses are structured, or they might want to do some business restructuring in advance of a borrowing if if, uh, they've got multiple businesses that maybe they don't qualify, but they could qualify themselves under the size requirements if they do some some restructuring of their their enterprise. Most oftentimes where you see size standards becoming an issue is um, hotel operators. Um, that's, a, that's a big one. Now, the alternative size standard has allowed for a little bit more ease of that, uh, for sure. But that's a, that's a classic um, ent- industry that has had a lot of size standards issues. Um, and then if you've got very affluent individuals, sometimes just, you know, whatever type of industries in general, those can become issues as well, but then potentially you're dealing with credit availability issues as well. So credit elsewhere issues. Any other questions? Oh, you're on mute. Jimmy just posted one. Can a business owner use uh, the an SBA loan for construction financing if he or she wants to build a building um, such as a standalone restaurant, et cetera. 
Um, if not, can the business owner use the SBA for permanent financing after the construction is completed? So that's a good question. Great question. And it's, uh, and, I'll, and I'll jump ahead to this next side because it basically brings us into that topic. So the answer is yes, under both scenarios. And I'll tell you that uh, depending upon the institution, sometimes it makes sense to do permanent financing as compared to doing construction financing out of the gate via SBA. Um, and so let me make a note to come back to that because I, I want to talk about that to a little bit more degree, but um, real quick, hit these uh, and then we can come back to that. So these are the types of proceed uses that are eligible within the, 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 the two programs. As I mentioned before, the 504 program is primarily a fixed asset financing program. So real estate or equipment that has, uh, that's going to be you know capitalized on the balance sheet are really the two uses that exist there. You'll see that in parentheses, parentheses I have the, the loan terms and amortizations that each classification would qualify for. So real estate can qualify for either a 20 or 25 year note, uh, and then equipment would be 10 years. Um, now on the 7A program, you'll see there's a larger variety and typically what you're going to see is, is that real estate again would be 25 years in amortization or, and then everything else is 10 years with the exception of equipment. If it has for one reason or another depreciable life beyond 10, the loan term can be based off of that extended depreciable life. So 10 years in general for a lot of these things is going to be significantly longer than what conventional lending would typically allow for from a loan term perspective, um, loan term and amortization perspective. So that is a tremendous benefit from a um, monthly payment perspective. Now on the topic of construction, yes, the, pro the, loan, the loan program will support construction out of the gate um, and or it will support takeout financing or permanent financing after the construction has been done. Um, the, uh, from a construction financing perspective out of the gate, I think the thing to be cognizant of is how much of, how much construction are we talking about and does the, the construction monitoring that has to occur under the program, the costs associated outweigh the, the benefits of doing the loan upfront versus doing some type of a bridge loan. So. The, the from a 7A or a 504 perspective, being that the government wants to ensure that the, pro the project gets finished as close to budget as possible without significant cost overruns, um, and that also the contractor is not paying other jobs outside of the job specifically, full construction monitoring is required if we were to do a construction loan out of the gate. Um, which tends to not be a terrible burden, but some some contractors, especially your um, less commercial, I would say, contractors tend to have issues with that because they like to see um, payments down ahead of schedule, you know, say 25% down at contract signing, 50%. Uh, another 50%, you know, halfway through and then 25% at completion or something like that, instead of doing the typical draw request that would exist under a construction loan. Um, if you are doing takeout financing under either one of these programs, the biggest thing to keep in mind is, is that your customer is documenting all of the costs as meticulously as possible so that the the bank can back into the requested dollar amount that goes into the um, and, and document that that was all tech, you know, truly part of construction. Um, now, I will say that from the perspective of if the borrower were to self fund all of the construction, sometimes that does occur, that can be a little bit more problematic for putting permanent financing in place. Um, I would recommend that if a customer was wanting to self-fund the construction and then get financing after the fact that they have that conversation with the bank before they do that. 
um, just because the reimbursement to the borrower can sometimes be um, an ineligible use of proceeds depending upon the institution and how the, the circumstances and the story kind of plays out. So um, that would be the only piece of advice that I have there. Again, Real quick to it, again point, having that relationship with the lender in advance proactively is definitely something that is important in so many respects. And I find that is just not something that borrowers or business owners can appreciate, right? They have to be thinking about how the bank is going to be looking at whatever it is that they're doing in advance. And what better way to understand that than to have start your dialogue early with the lender, right? Makes a lot of sense. Yeah, I would say, I mean, some, you know, there are, there have been times where I've had conversations with people a year in advance of a transaction, just to, as you previously mentioned, Michael, to sort of position the request the right way um, at that point when they do want to uh, make application. Um, another thing too, a lot of times, or not a lot of times, but at times people are like, will, or will come to us and say, how much can I qualify for? And that's a difficult answer sometimes to make. I mean, there are, we have our general underwriting guidelines that we will talk about that we can um, sort of back into a number, but a lot of times it's more about, well, what do you need the money for? Um, tell me what your costs are, and then let's figure out a solution on how we are going to get there, whether we're relying upon historical cash flow or potentially projected income or projected cash flow or some sort of combination of the two. Um, quick point to make here too, as well on the 7A program with the use of proceeds, uh, it does support lines of credit. So that actually falls under two potentially different subcategories of the program. Uh, the, the SBA Express is a program that supports lines of credit up to $350,000. And then you have a program called the Cap Lines Program, which can support lines of credit up to $5 million. Now, the Cap Line Program is not a program that's offered necessarily by every SBA lender. And generally speaking, that is a result of the administrative oversight that's required on an ongoing basis with those loans. So um, my experience has been a lot of times you'll see banks that do do the cap lines, do them up to a million dollars because that's a particular break point in some of the ongoing monitoring. And then some of your more boutique lenders will do the cap lines all the way up to $5 million. But point is, there is a program that does exist. You just ha might have to search a little bit harder for some of those lenders that actually do the participation in that particular program. Hey, Adam, we have a couple of other questions here, but let's, um, I want to make sure you get through your materials. Maybe we'll, and I'm just letting everybody know in advance that we're going to hold a couple more questions until towards the end so that uh, Adam can get through his stuff here. Sounds like a plan. So, um, credit criteria, how are these loans underwritten? So in general, these loans are underwritten very similar to how a conventional loan is going to be underwritten. You know, our first and foremost thing that we're looking at is the borrower or the business has the ability to repay. These are not necessarily collateral based repayment loans. The collateral is a secondary source of repayment. And then the guarantee is a tertiary, but cash flow is king. So typically, the minimum threshold that a lender is going to want to see per the SBA's SOP is a 1.25 times debt service coverage ratio. And I've given you uh, um, kind of the calculation of how to get to that. Um, really, it's EBITDA over annual debt obligations. Um, now, I will say that certain one-time expenses or extraordinary expenses that may have been uh, recognized can be um, included in that cash flow calculation. Uh, and typically where you'll see that a lot of times is when you're doing a uh, transaction where you have a business that is being purchased and you're adding back seller salaries and then only putting in then a percent, you know, a certain level of new owner salaries. Um, we can use projections. Um, generally, projections are going to be utilized either in a startup scenario or an expansion scenario. And when I say expansion, I'm talking like from the perspective of, say, 
a business that's looking to grow um, has it has a defined growth strategy that this loan is going to allow for they're either moving into a space that is larger or they're buying inventory that is going to be more inventory than they've had it's not typically the projections that we're going to continue doing business like we t like we have and historically we've lost money but now we you know we know we've got a better marketing pitch and our projections show that we're going to be able to make this work. I'd say that's not the type of projection-based lending most SBA lenders would uh, be able to get behind. And I think and you then, answered. I think you answered one of the questions not from Diane that whether a, um, an SBA loan can be used to fund a construction renovation build out of an existing building to make it more suitable for the borrower's needs. I think the answer to that absolutely. is yes, you absolutely can, and that's where the projections would what might come into play. Yep. And, and, and um, I, I'll say also too, banks tend to sometimes want to do SBA loans, excuse me, construction projects as an SBA loan just because of the risk that can be inherent in a construction project as well. Um, so that sometimes is a, a factor as well there too. Um, the one big thing that I wanted to point out too here on the cash flow um, calculation is, is that some lenders would consider the SBA's approach to be a hybrid global perspective in that we are looking at the principal's earnings coming from the business, whether it's W-2 earnings, uh, guaranteed payments to partners or distributions, and then we're adding back anything that's considered to be excessive based upon their personal obligations. Um, to cash flow because sometimes you can really, you know, for example, doctors a lot of times will strip out a lot of the cash of a company or the profit of a company to the point where it wouldn't work from a traditional underwriting perspective. But if you add back that um, sort of the excess distributions or earnings, then it makes sense. So from a collateral perspective, I mentioned previously that a lot of these loans are going to be under secured to some point or to some level, but the government does require that we try to collateralize the loans to the fullest extent possible. So what does that mean? So in a scenario where we are purchasing assets or an asset, the bank would be required to have a senior lien position or a first lien position on that particular piece of whatever. Um, and that would also be that would feed into uh, the fourth bullet about the debt refinance requirements. If we were refinancing some debt that um, had specific liens on pieces of equipment or what have you, we have to maintain those same priority positions as well in, throughout the refinance. Um, and sometimes that can be problematic when people have leveraged assets over and over. So critical point to understand there. Now I will say that um, if you come to an SBA lender and the borrower is not, um, the bank is not an incumbent of the of the borrower, it, 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 it is possible for the SBA to provide lending in a junior lien position if there's not a specific asset being purchased. Let's just say we're doing um, leasehold renovation, leasehold improvements, or financing working capital, inventory, what have you. It is theoretically possible to lend into a junior. Um, blanket position that becomes more institutional credit uh, based there. Um, something that is throughout the, SO, the SBA lending um, rules is that the, the, the goalposts might be this far apart, but the banks always have the ability to bring them in. So that particular bullet is, is an example of that. Now I mentioned how a lot of these loans will be under secured and the, and the government requires us to guarantee um, collateralize these to the fullest extent possible. So what does that mean does that in a scenario where we are working in an undersecured position, if a principal has greater than 25% equity in their home, 25% or greater equity in their home, oftentimes is going to be required that they pledge that home as a junior mortgage. So that's something to very, to be, to be cognizant of. Um, and then dropping down to the fifth bullet, 504 program specific. So this program, the 504 program does not allow for any unsecured lending. And so 
that there's, and that's largely because of the fact that it's financing a fixed asset. So you'll see the LTV thresholds that exist for this program. Um, if we're lending to an existing business that's in no particular type of special property, it can be as high as 90%. Um, if it's a startup or a business that is buying a limited use property, think of like a, um, a car wash, um, yeah, a, a garage that has in-ground pits or a, you know, a, a swimming academy that has in-ground pools, those would be considered limited use. LTV there is 85%. And then if you've got a startup in a limited use property, it's 80%. And that's all just risk mitigation. And that's defined by the government's program specifics. Some other considerations. Um, mentioned before that the program can go up to 100%. Uh, the 7A program can go up to 100% financing, but oftentimes banks like to see at least 10% uh, equity equity injection or skin in the game uh, on most of these loans. Now, that's not equity in the form of pledged other collateral, but rather legitimate cash into that specific transaction. So it's not, hey, I've got uh, a free and clear property over here that I want to pledge in support of this. No, that you've got to have actual cash that can be put into it. Now, there are scenarios where you could leverage up that property and then put the cash in, um, but you've got to be able to demonstrate repayment on that debt for that specific property outside of the SBA loan. Um, I will say that gifts can be considered, which is um, useful. Um, gift letters would be sort of the way that you document that. Um, and then guarantor experience, principal's experience is always a, a, a big one too. Um, if we're talking about somebody who's buying a business, they've got to be able to show either direct experience in the industry or some sort of translatable skill. Now, if we're lending to an existing operator, you know, if the, if the financials are strong, they've obviously demonstrated their ability to be a, a, an operator. Um, and then I'd say the other thing that's not a this doesn't exist anywhere in any of the SBA regulations, but something that's prevalent across the industry is, is that the program's really not designed or it's not, you don't see many lenders using the program for investment opportunities by the principals. So you, what that means is typically you have to have at least one principal or primarily a guarantor who's involved in the day-to-day -day operations of the business. This isn't some sort of side hustle or side job for them. Um, and then the other big point is anyone of 20% or greater ownership must guarantee the loan. There's no really short way around that one at all. I get, I get some people who want to buy restaurants because they've decided they're quitting their job and they want to pursue their life's dream and they've never owned a restaurant before. And I always, I always tell them, and uh, other than my first piece of advice to anybody that presents with that is don't do it. That's the first yeah. thing I tell them. And then the secondly is <laughs> you're going to have an uphill climb getting approved. If you've never owned a restaurant before to borrow money, to buy a restaurant, <laughs> you know, good luck with that. Yeah, that would, <laughs> that would be a pretty difficult task. Um, maybe yeah. start with a food truck out of the gate or something like that, but right. <laughs> um, yeah. I, I mean, and now I will say a, a way to solve that is, is if they've got a, you know, somebody who they, they trust, who is, say, the chef or the GM, who is willing to be a part of the ownership team and be a guarantor to the transaction, that's a good way to solve that problem. Yeah. Um, so I have one more slide that talks about the process, Michael, and then I have a couple of examples. I know that there were some questions. Um, I can go through this real quick and then we can take the questions if that works. Yeah, let's do that. That sounds like a good plan. Okay. Um, so process overview, you know, what does the process typically look like for these loans? I would love to tell you that an SBA loan with all of the advances in technology is as streamlined as a lot of other borrowing um, platforms that are out there or vehicles that are out there. But unfortunately that's not the case still to this day. So in general, an SBA loan tends to take between three to four months from start to finish. And you can 
break it down into these three broad categories of, of, of a life cycle. So you've got the initial stage, which is basically the pre-qualification and, and, and proposal. So that's the borrower and the lender determining whether or not there's a viable transaction based upon the cursory review of historical financials or projections relative to the request. Um, and then the, bar, the, the, the lender then structuring the transaction and providing a proposal to the borrower to say, hey, this is what we're looking at. This is how we propose it. Um, what do you think? Um, assuming that the, the borrower wants to move forward, there's then the application and the underwriting stage. Now, this can vary from institution to institution. Some institutions will gather uh, fewer documents up front and then leave the remainder, remainder of the documentation collection efforts for closing. And then others will collect more up front and then have less to collect in the closing stage. But typically, um, in, in either scenario, you generally have a, a, a period of time from the proposal to underwriting that is between a week to two um, based upon getting additional documentation necessary for that formal underwriting package. And that underwriting can take from two to three weeks based upon the complexity of the transaction. Um, sometimes it's quicker, uh, especially with very simple transactions, but um, in general, this is kind of what that timeline looks like. So about a month is the point from proposal to then commitment. And then once the commitment is authorized, you're into the closing stage. Now the closing stage is where that funding allocation could be achieved ahead of closing the loan that we talked about earlier. Um, and this is basically a lot of submission of information necessary to close the loan. Uh, you're thinking of things like business insurance, Proof, corporate docs, making sure the borrower has the correct resolutions to, to engage in the transaction. Um, if it's a purchase of real estate or a business, the purchase agreements, making sure that those are all to the to the degree or caliber that we would want to that the SBA would require them to be to protect the borrower, as well as any return of third party reports. Um, now I mentioned the this is where the closing stage is where the allocation for the borrower's funding comes from the government. It's important to note that in most SBA lender scenarios, you're, if you're talking to a, a lender that is doing a 7A loan, chances are strong that it is a delegated lender, which means they often have the ability to, prove, to approve the loans on the behalf of the government. Um, there are unique circumstances to which they would have to send the loan to the government for its actual approval, as well as there are certain lenders who don't have delegated authority that have to send it to the government for its approval. Those scenarios can double or triple this time frame um, sometimes, and that's just because of all of the things that we were discussing that are going on with the SBA, all of the other strains on its resources. And basically, because of the fact that once it hits their desk, they're re review, they're re underwriting this thing from scratch themselves. It's the first time they've seen this transaction. So the, the the takeaway here is to the extent that a borrower is able to um, pursue this path with a lender who has delegated authority and also a transaction that can be processed under delegated authority, that is the takeaway there. Um, that's a critical piece of inf or a critical sort of point to, to this whole process. For you know, for anybody that's associated with Legal Shield out there that's are connecting uh, your customers with uh, legal advice, you know there are there's a great opportunity for you to place people with legal advice in advance to help them get their their documents in order, their their governance documents for their businesses, their OLCs, whatever it is, those are all things that they're going to need to present to the lender in advance as part of the approval uh, process, and we can help get them prepared for that. And especially if they are engaged in some type of a transaction, right, with a third party, uh, and that's the reason for the, the loan process, they really are going to want to have a quarterback 
to help run that deal, right? And you really, that's not really what the what guys like Adam are supposed to be doing. They're not really representing um, these business owners or these borrowers in their transaction. There are a lot of things going on in the transaction outside of just the loan aspects to it. But having a, an experienced transactional lawyer involved is going to really help the process um, along. Uh, I would imagine, Adam, that working with somebody that's experienced in these types of transactions and loans is a big assist for, for you guys in getting the, the ball across the finish line. Uh, significantly. And I mean, uh, and, and it, very much so in the case where you're working with some type of a purchase, whether it's real estate or a business. I mean, I've had transactions where it, a lot of times banks will require borrowers be represented by counsel. Not always, but um, a lot of times, if, especially in those types of scenarios. And I've had times where the the wrong type of counsel, not just because of the type of law that they practice, has represented. And it's, you know, the, the re back and forth, the multiple iterations of the purchase agreements, things of that nature, just deal fatigue um, across all parties starts to set in and puts the transaction in jeopardy too. So yes, I would, I would echo the, your comments there, Michael. Uh, let's take a couple of these questions because um, we're getting close to, we're just a little bit over the hour. So let's get these out of the way and then we can talk a little bit about some examples. Um, so Ryan, uh, Cody, hey Ryan, this is, I think this is Ryan, my colleague from Ohio. He asks, what do you tell a customer that applied with a lender and then didn't hear back and cannot get a hold of them anymore? What's, um, does going to another lender cause problems with multiple applications pending with the SBA? So, it, 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 I mean, if they've gotten, if they've not had follow up from the lender that they initially had the conversations with, the chances that there's an application with the government are slim to none. Um, just because of the fact that the the application with the government doesn't start generally until the approval itself from the bank has occurred. So I would, I would, you know, if if, if you have somebody who hasn't ha heard back from who they started the process with, then I would say that they would they're they're not in any risk of having ha having multiple applications with the government. I think it would be very unlikely. Right. And that's certainly where somebody that's knowledgeable, like their attorney, can help to steer them to a lender that actually knows what they're doing. Right. <laughs> you know, on SBA, on SBA loans, that's right. helpful information to get, get to get clued in. Right. Uh, lawyers, accountants have uh, um, their resources to, to help customers find a reputable uh, lender that can get the ball over the finish line. Uh, Jimmy asks, um, He's very happy to hear that uh, 7A loans can be used for um, partner buyouts, but he also asks, um, can those loans be used to finance the purchase of a franchise um, if there is no real estate involved? And so many franchises do just lease space, typically yep. for at least 10 years, right? Ab yep, absolutely. Um, the biggest thing with franchise lending from an SBA perspective, and I apologize, I didn't put this into the um, slide deck. But the biggest thing is, is that the, the franchise itself has to be approved from the SBA. Now, the way you, that you are able to check that is a lot of times the franchisor will know whether or not they're SBA approved. But if whoever they're working with doesn't know or the borrower themselves doesn't know, you can look at uh, the government's website. And if you just Google SBA franchise registry, it's a multi-page document that lists all of the approved franchisees franchise concepts um, that that are eligible under SBA financing and if your franchise concept is not on there that doesn't mean that it's necessarily ineligible it just has not been approved and there are steps to which the franchisor can take to become approved as well um, but that is also a very common type of loan that we see with SBA 7A loans, where startup franchise, leasehold improvements, startup costs, uh, things of that nature. 
Uh, Wes asks, are there any specific considerations for veterans or disabled veterans? Do they get any advantages in the, uh, in the uh, SBA loan programs? So, yes, there are programs. I don't particularly think that they benefit the borrower, the veteran, um, necessarily. And this, I'm, I myself am a veteran, too, so I'm not trying to be disrespectful of the, of the borrower themselves. So the, there is a program out there that is um, called the Veterans Advantage Program, and it has a threshold of $500,000 in loan amounts. The benefit is, is that the borrower does not have to pay a guarantee fee typically. Now, that's not necessarily something that's carved in stone every year that has to be reauthorized by Congress. Um, otherwise, the funding fee still applies there. What, they, what the agency hoped to do was is that the program itself carries a 90% guarantee on those specific loans as compared to the traditional 75% uh, under the just normal 7A program. So they were hoping that additional 15% of guarantee would help to in incentivize banks to lend to veterans more than, than, than not, than, you know, than their, their, their peer non-veteran. But truthfully, the 15% does not typically make a difference from a bank's perspective in whether or not they're looking to approve, w whether or not they will approve a transaction. So, um, Yes, there are programs. Are they functionally sufficient? N not really. Okay. Jimmy asked uh, uh, an offline question about restaurant revitalization fund grants. Um, those don't go through banks. They, I, th I believe they goes directly to the SBA. And there is a link on right. our website that will have all of the links to apply the application form and for information that the business owners need to have gathered uh, to support their application. So those, those do not go through lenders. Yep. All right, those are the questions that we had. Do you wanna talk real quickly about the loan examples? Yeah, so just two quick loan examples that I um, came up with. And these are based um, it, you know, on real types of transactions that we've done, um, not necessarily same dollar figures or anything, but um, this one is a startup based construction loan. Um, and you can apply it to any type of industry, really, um, maybe with the exception of, say, restaurants in the moment of COVID. But um, anyways, the, you'll see on the left-hand side, project uses. So, this, you know, this is how a typical startup construction-based loan would be um, structured, right? So these are all of the costs that, are, that we would identify Theoretically, a million dollars for the purchase of the real estate and the associated construction. Um, you Three hundred thousand dollars for equipment purchases for whatever it is that the, the business plans to do there. Um, a dollar amount for startup working capital. Um, and a lot of times when we're pegging these dollar amounts for working capital, we're really relying on the borrower to kind of give us their estimates as far as what they need. I wouldn't say that there's a minimum or a maximum, um, but if, I would say that if somebody is throwing out a very low number because of the potential issues of meeting the 10% down requirements, the, there is sort of the, um, the smell test, if you will, in that, you know, does this seem right? Does this seem logical? Um, big thing here, though, too, is the interest reserve and the contingencies that the contingency that we build into the loan. Um, so hypothetically, a hundred thousand dollar interest reserve and contingency. Um, generally speaking, contingency is going to be uh, ten percent of the construction contract amount, and then the interest reserve is for however long it is expected that construction is going to take, plus usually three to four months extra padding because we know that there's delays typically. Um, and then associated soft costs as well as closing costs. So think of things like engineering, permitting, um, lawyer, title insurance, <laughs> things of that nature. Lawyer, yes. Council fees. That, um, that figure doesn't include council fees. It, the council fees would be double <laughs> that number, right? <laughs> <laughs> so those are, but in general, we come up with a project of 1.575 million. Um, 
10% down is where we would tend to start with that type of transaction. Depending upon the specifics, it could be more. Um, but, and then because of the fact that this is, this would have a large um, component dedicated to real estate, this would be a 25 year term loan, um, as you see on the right hand side of the slide here, largely because, and this really benefits the borrower because of the fact that it's going to be a much lower payment, monthly payment than it would typically otherwise be. Um, the one thing that I didn't mention in any of the slides previously, um, prepayment penalties. So prepayment penalties exist in certain circumstances, other times they don't exist. The trigger is for the 7A program, loans of 15 years or greater do have a prepayment penalty. It is 3% of the outstanding balance in the first year, 2% in the second year, and then 1% in the third year. Borrowers have the ability to prepay up to 25% of the principal balance in any of those three years without penalty. So it's a pretty lenient prepayment penalty on the 7A program. And then for the loans that are less than 15 years, there's no penalty. Um, the, set, the, the 504 program has a little bit different prepayment penalty because of the fact that it's a bond program. It, the, the government piece is a, basically a breakage fee, um, but it can easily be calculated by a, a rough sort of estimation of 10% of the government's portion is the fee in the first year, sliding down to 1% in the 10th year, and then it goes away after the 10th year. So that's one example. And then um, another so you, example is part you want, you want your customers to be successful, just not too successful too fast. <laughs> right. It, it, yeah. The bank, I mean, it is still Bank's a business. Banks got to make its money point, on these, so. right? <laughs> exactly. It is still a business. So. Yeah. Just like the borrowers. Um, and then another example that a lot of, you know, this is what I would say the business acquisitions and the real estate deals are two of the ones that we tend to see the most of franchise startups are another one, but um, that's point being is that's why I highlighted these two uh, real estate and a partner buyout scenarios. Um, another example of the projected uses million dollar stock buyout partner buyout or business acquisition. They can be either stock or asset doesn't necessarily matter. Obviously if you're doing a partner buyout, I'm pretty sure they they're going to structure stock purchase in those scenarios. Um, Three hundred thousand dollars of working capital for future operating expenses, and then closing costs associated with the transaction. In this type of a scenario, we are assuming that there was sufficient um, balance sheet equity to be able to do a hundred percent financing here. And the trigger for that is when you have a part. It's only available in partner buyout situations. Um, if there is not greater than more than nine to one debt to worth on the balance sheet, then they qualify for 100% financing. If they don't, then the 10% equity injection requirement still uh, or comes into play. And then this would the term on this would be 10 years based upon the use of proceeds. Um, and big highlight here: significant collateral shortfall given the fact that this is a service business. Um, most of their assets would not tend to be um, assigned much, if any, collateral value. And so um, that's, again, a big reason why banks utilize the SBA, because there are a, a large number of these types of businesses that exist uh, that banks want to bank, but still have, you know, their regulatory sort of credit, conventional credit standards that they have to meet. And this is how we can s solve those problems. Adam, are, when you say a partner buyout, does that mean... Mm -hmm. Somebody that's already in the business buying a partner out, this would this apply to a third party who wants to come into the business? So great question. Uh, this is assuming that the individual is already a partner in the business. Now, that and your question triggers something that I should have put otherwise too. Whether we're talking about a partner buyout or a third party buying a business the SBA loan proceeds have to fund 100% change in control of the business. 
So let's say, so point is you can't, the SBA proceeds can't support buy-ins or partial buyouts. Now, let's just say that there was three partners and only one was exiting. Let's assume for whatever sake that partner one of the par only one of the partners is getting the exiting partner partner's shares you can still make that transaction eligible assuming that the other partner provides a guarantee to the transaction um, or if they're both receiving shares pro rata whatever and they're both guarantors that's el that's eligible as well but basically the remaining equity partners would have to be guarantors to the transaction is the point. I know there are a lot of business owners out there. I mean, finding somebody to buy their business can be a, a real challenge. What if you have um, a business owner who has some long-term employees who decide that they want to buy the business from the boss? Would this program mm -hmm. be eligible uh, for, for that think, type of a situation? I think you see that a lot typically. Uh, and it's a very desirable situation a lot of times for the bank because you've got individuals who are intimate to the inner workings of the business taking over as compared to somebody from the outside. Um, the challenge can sometimes be coming up with that 10% requirement um, just because, you know, owners own or owners earn generally what they earn, which is a lot more than what the W-2 employees earn. Um, and they don't always necessarily aggregate those earnings as well as the owners do. Now, a way to overcome that is, is the seller can provide some financing, some seller financing um, that I was just going to ask that <laughs> if the seller could yeah. Yeah, kick, the, kick that back in or, or take a piece, take back some of the paper, as they say, right? They can now. The now the SBA has placed a limit on how much they can help. Not to say that they can't take back more, but the aid that can be provided for the debt for the ten percent requirement, the bar the seller can only provide half of that support through a note, which would have to be on full standby for the life of the SBA loan. Okay. Full standby being full standby being no payment to be made on that note for the life of the SBA loan. Thank you. Yep. So any questions, any, any other questions for Adam? I know we, we answered lots of questions along the way. And feel free to just speak up or, or put them in the chat, whatever you would like. Well, Adam, I think we've answered them all, apparently. That's a first. Sounds good. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I want to thank you all for attending, and I want to thank Adam especially for participating um, and, and leading us through the conversation. Very knowledgeable, really great information uh, to, to understand about the SBA programs and, and how FNB assists its customers uh, with SBA lending. So maybe we'll have Adam back another time for another topic. So. With that, I thank I, you all. And uh, Adam, any final words? I appreciate, Michael, the opportunity. Um, another thing, too, that I would say, I mean, as much as I would like to uh, uh, drive business this way, but as a, just as, you know, some words of wisdom to another good use, uh, resource, if you are trying to assist customers outside of an area to which you're familiar with, is the SBA's field offices, which you can find their contact information at on the SBA's website. Um, Google, great resource for getting to those specific locations. But um, if you're working with borrowers in geographic areas that you're not familiar with, uh, a lot of times those field offices can be a real resource as well. Great. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Have a great rest of your week. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye.